All right, thank you so much for coming, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, our talk today, as you can see on the screen, is streamlining FedRAMP compliance with CNCF technologies. Um, so we wanted to start out by doing just like a quick poll of the audience. Um, how many of you are currently going through a FedRAMP accreditation process? Okay, a lot, actually, that's great. Um, okay, how many people are maybe familiar with FedRAMP but like thinking about getting into the process? Okay, also a lot. And is there anyone who maybe has heard of FedRAMP but doesn't really know anything else beyond that? Okay, also a couple, okay, great. Um, well, we have some introductory material, um, but uh, to sort of explain what FedRAMP is, what the process looks like, um, and then we're gonna talk about some of the challenges, of course, that we faced and how we solved those. So hopefully there's stuff that's relevant to everyone. Um, before we dive into the content, we just wanted to do brief intros. Um, apologies to those of you who came to our talk on Tuesday, as you've already heard these, um, but we'll keep it brief. Uh, my name is Ali Monfrey. I'm a senior architect of our federal government business at Palantir. Um, essentially what that means is I lead our cloud architecture and kind of our cloud hosted deployments across our federal government portfolio. Um, and I also lead business development for our Apollo product and FedStar program that we'll talk a little bit about um, later today. Uh, and four years ago, I actually led Palantir's initial efforts to become FedRAMP and IL-5 accredited. Um, so that's how I got really familiar with this space and then kind of built up our whole um, technical federal compliance practice um, that oversees all of our accreditations and all of our ATOs in the government today. Hello, folks. My name is Vlad. Uh, I'm a lead in the production infrastructure group. I lead all the teams that manage and deploy Kates in all the places Palantir does uh, deploys this software. So that's uh, commercial cloud, high site cloud, on-premise, and edge as well. All right, um, so just a brief overview of our agenda. Um, we did wanna do a little bit of an overview of Palantir as a company, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, um, and talk a little bit about our journey um, getting into FedRAMP and kind of some of the, the things that we faced uh, as we initially started going through it. And then we're going to dive into some very specific sort of technical challenges. So as many of you know, uh, there are many challenges associated with pursuing FedRAMP accreditation, um, but we wanted to pull out a few uh, that are, tend to be the trickiest and were certainly the trickiest for us uh, that we'll talk about in terms of challenges we faced. And then Vlad's gonna talk about the solutions um, and how we solved them. And uh, hopefully we have plenty of time at the end for Q&A as well for any of you who have questions uh, that you wanna ask us after we're done. Okay, uh, so introducing Palantir just very briefly. Um, Palantir was founded in 2003 after the events of 9-11 with the mission to help the federal government make better use and sense of its data um, while protecting privacy and civil liberties. So all of our first products were about uh, data integration, data analysis, kind of operational use cases involving data. Um, and we first began working in the Intel community but as our products uh, and our business has evolved over the course of the past 20 years, we've grown tremendously and expanded into many other parts of the federal government. Uh, some of our clients you can see on the slide here expanded into DOD and also expanded into kind of federal health and the civilian government space as well. So you can imagine that FedRAMP and impacts level accreditation as our business started to grow um, was top of mind for, for many years, honestly, before we started or decided to really go for it. Um, so for those of you who aren't super familiar with it, um, FedRAMP and impact level accreditation are specifically accreditations required uh, if you want to sell your software specifically as a cloud hosted SaaS to the federal government, um, as opposed to you know on-prem uh, or like a self-hosted self-licensed model where the government manages everything. So for us, as our business continued to grow and scale, um, delivering our software as a cloud-hosted SaaS was a super important thing because um, we don't have that many engineers and kind of needed to support a lot of environments. So that's what led us down the journey of thinking, all right, it's probably time to do FedRAMP and impact level accreditation. So uh, we made that decision. We had a couple of back and forth, couple false starts, uh, but we made the decision to really go for it in the fall of 2018. And we spent all of 2019 um, achieving accreditation. So kind of at the tail end of 2019 is when it formally came through. Um, and as we're going to talk a lot about today, our original FedRAMP and IL-5 accreditation did not include any Kubernetes or any cloud native technologies. 
Um, so we got through the accreditation process, but we ran into a lot of difficulties with efficiently managing and maintaining the system um, once we kind of uh, achieved accreditation, and that's ultimately what led us down the journey of uh, moving more towards a, a Kate's-based architecture. So once we made that switch, a lot of the aspects of the accreditation process became easier, um, and we've actually been able to reduce our dedicated headcount um, by 80% um, just by standardizing our environment using Kubernetes and meeting a lot of the controls at the infrastructure level as opposed to the application level. Um, so we're super excited to be talking to you all about that today, um, what we've learned, kind of what we've done, and hopefully some of this content is uh, useful for you all who are going through the process as well. Quick overview of the FedRAMP process at a high level um, for those who, you know, are, are maybe a, a little bit newer to this space. Um, I'll say upfront, uh, I mentioned FedRAMP and I also mentioned this thing called impact level um, as being the accreditations required for cloud-hosted SaaS applications. FedRAMP is the uh, accreditation framework that they have for the civilian government space. So if you want to work in the civilian space, FedRAMP is the one that they use. Um, the impact level accreditation process is the one that the Department of Defense um, or DOD uses. Um, the impact level process can actually inherit from the FedRAMP one, though. So, for example, if you pursue FedRAMP High and then you want to pursue IL-5, the DOD will actually accept your FedRAMP High accreditation and then only assess the impact level 5 controls that, you know, are sort of layered on top or above and beyond what you've already done for FedRAMP. So I bring that up just to say we're talking specifically about FedRAMP today. Title of the talk is FedRAMP, but all the controls we're talking about are also relevant for the impact level process. So for those of you who are specifically looking into DOD work, um, all of this content is going to be relevant for you all as well. So to become FedRAMP accredited, uh, there's a lot of steps you have to go through, as you can see on this slide. This slide is also just from FedRAMP.gov, so you know, feel free to take a look at their website and you can get all this there too. Um, but at a very high level, you need to identify a sponsor or be accepted by the JAB, the Joint Authorization Board, um, which is essentially your kind of entry point into entering the process. And then you need to document uh, and implement hundreds of security controls. You have to have those controls validated by a third-party assessment organization or 3PAO. Um, and then you need to do a final review with your sponsor and with the FedRAM Program Management Office. So our talk today is not going to focus on, you know, kind of the entirety of this process, but rather on some of the security controls that are particularly challenging to meet, um, and again, how we use Kates and, and CNCF tools to meet them more easily. So we will head into some of the challenges that we faced. With FedRAMP um, and impact level accreditation, there are many different scanning requirements. Um, that you have to meet. So you have to both run these scans and then appropriately, appropriately remediate any issues that they flag. Um, so you can see them here on the slide. Vulnerability scans are a big one. Virus scanning, you have to do something called STIG scans. Um, STIGs are, these are essentially compliance scans that check for appropriate configuration of specific pieces of your infrastructure. So for example, there are STIGs for operating systems and databases, and so you need to scan those and make sure that those are appropriately configured to government standards um, and secure. And then you also need to do web application scans. The vast majority of these uh, also need to be done weekly or monthly, um, and you kind of need to be consistently remediating and patching your infrastructure accordingly. So in a pre-Kubernetes world, where not all of our infrastructure was uniform and using immutable AMIs and container images, this meant we were scanning every single piece of live infrastructure that we were using, um, which for Palantir was actually thousands of hosts. So we have a microservice architecture and there's hundreds of microservices for every kind of implementation or deployment of our software. And then we also had multiple different stacks for kind of all of our government agencies. So the, the scale of this was just pretty tremendous. Um, a lot of these scans do affect the performance of your system. They're pretty CPU intensive. Um, and just, it was very difficult to keep track of the results of all these scans, aggregate them appropriately, and honestly just sort of efficiently manage from a vulnerability management standpoint. Uh, on a related note, patching, for a very similar reason, um, was also a nightmare. <laughs> so rolling out all of the changes um, meant patching and rebooting every single one of these hosts um, that, again, we had thousands of. So uh, in addition to that just being a, a time-consuming and sort of onerous process, a lot of our microservices have sort of service inter interdependencies. 
um, and there are a lot of uptime requirements associated with FedRAMP and impact level environments as well. So kind of orchestrating this whole patch and reboot cycle in a way that wouldn't cause any downtime was also just a very complex kind of engineering problem. So we were spending, again, just tons of dedicated engineering time and effort and humans um, figuring this out. The third challenge that I want to talk about is FIPS encryption. Um, for those of you who are familiar with this process, you know how painful FIPS encryption is. Um, Palantir is certainly no exception. Uh, it's really difficult. For those who are unfamiliar with FIPS, um, this is a government uh, standard for encryption. And all of your data, both in transit and at rest, must use only FIPS validated cipher suites and crypto libraries. So this list is really quite small. Um, and it frequently takes a long time for new Cypher suites to become FIPS validated, even if they're FIPS compliant, um, just because that formal accreditation process with the government takes, can take a long time. Um, so encryption at rest has become a bit easier in recent years with things like KMS, um, but doing FIPS encryption in transit is still very difficult. And again, when you have hundreds of services and you're also dependent on a lot of open source tech, like Palantir is, um, maintaining FIPS validated traffic between, from service to service, basically between all of these services and enforcing in every single one of the libraries is a pretty insurmountable problem. Um, and Vlad is going to talk a lot more about what we've done to make that a little bit easier for ourselves. The final thing here, uh, we just wanted to touch on a couple of additional things that became challenges when we started thinking about moving to Kate's. So they weren't necessarily challenges before Kubernetes, but when we started thinking about that architecture, there are just a couple of additional considerations to take into account that we wanted to sort of share with you all um, so that you're aware as well. First one is um, ingress and egress. So how you're managing kind of your front door and your proxy. We were previously using Nginx in a pre-Kubernetes world. Um, but FIPS encryption for Nginx is only available with their paid Nginx Plus um, product and additionally not designed for container-first environments. So as we first started kind of experimenting with Kubernetes, um, we ran into some performance challenges with that as well. So Vlad's going to talk more about that and kind of how we solved for it. And the last one here is monitoring and incident response, um, which of course is a hugely important set of controls that you have to meet to make sure that you're monitoring the environment and that it's secure. We were using OS query um, prior, again, in a pre kates world, which worked very well when all of our software ran as a unique process in the host Linux namespaces. Um, but with Kates, when all the process names are the same, OS query was not enough for us to be able to kind of adequately distinguish between good actors and malicious actors. So this is something we needed to solve for as well, and Vlad's going to go into a lot more detail about that. So those are all the challenges, uh, and I'll now hand it over to Vlad for the solutions. First, I want to talk about vulnerability and compliance scanning. Uh, going to talk about the operating system. So as Ali mentioned, you need to stick all the software that um, you have in your FedRAM package. And in this case, like the operating system, major vendors have this STIGs published for their uh, for the OSs. Canonical has one for, uh, for Ubuntu. Red Hat has one for RHEL. Uh, what you should expect here is like lag when uh, the stigs actually get validated by by DISA. For example, like Ubuntu twenty two oh four still doesn't have a stig, and I think um, RHEL nine has a stig as of last month, but was released some time ago. So you're you're going to face challenges when you want to upgrade to to a new OS, and in most cases you actually won't be able to. Um, the next thing that we did moving to Kate's is uh, we started treating all the nodes the same and uh, we decided to move to basically run an immutable machine image. Uh, this allowed us to actually apply all the compliance requirements uh, in CI and actually scan for them. So our developers get like feedback faster if they do something that uh, invalidates the, the compliance of, of the machine. Another big change that uh, we decided to to do in, in our Kates-based systems is that every machine is going to live up to 72 hours. So like, we're, we're going to nuke it when it hits like the, the three-day mark. We did this mostly from a security reason, but it had uh, very nice side effects when it uh, related to patching. So patching for us means like just bumping up uh, versions of software in our machine image 
and then we roll it out to production, and in three days, we have the certainty that the vulnerability was actually patched, and this helped us to roll out things very fast. For example, when the run CCV happened a couple of years ago, we were able to like deploy it across the fleet in like three days, and we didn't really suffer from, from it. Moving to, to container images here, basically for uh, for vulnerability scanning, it's like we um, we run uh, we have an, an internal golden image that uh, that all the products use. <clears throat> this golden image gets updated daily with latest patches from from upstream, and then all the downstream products that use this container image uh, get built automatically. So we have like a waterfall model. First, you update the golden image, and then automation triggers all the downstream builds. Um, on top of this, we decided to embed Trivi in our software development lifecycle. So during CI, we actually scan all the container images that go to production to catch any CVs that uh, appeared uh, after the, the golden image got uh, got updated. Next, going to talk about like FIPS encryption and, and network security in the FedRAM context. Uh, one of the checklist. Uh, Items in, in the in the stick checklist is running a FIPS validated kernel in crypto libraries. Here you have options like Ubuntu Pro, RHEL, and, and others. Uh, what you should expect is again uh, uh, long processing times for NIST uh, to validate new kernels. Uh, we uh, we wanted to use some new features from like 5.1 kernel or like a newer kernel for like eBPF features, and we couldn't because Ubuntu Pro still has an older kernel and NIST did not validate it yet. And now moving up the stack for service to service communication, uh, we run Cilium as like the CNI of choice in all our environments, and we had to encrypt. Uh, uh, traffic between services using like FIPS validated cipher suites. And for this, we decided to turn on IPsec encryption uh, in Cilium. Uh, you can do it with a value in the, in the Helm chart. And this actually works in the various routing modes of Cilium that, that we use. For example, in, in Amazon, we use the, the ENI direct routing mode. And in Azure, we use the, the overlay routing mode. On top of this, uh, the FedRAMP uh, checklist has a bunch of rules about how you secure traffic. Uh, and for this, we also decided to like use Cilium because it has like very powerful uh, network policy primitives. And we also run it in like a deny by default mode. The FIPS uh, theme continues for like ingress and, and egress traffic. Uh, so this traffic needs also to be uh, encrypted with FIPS validated cipher suites. And as Ali mentioned in, in the previous um, cloud architecture, we are using uh, Nginx plus. We had to pay for it to, to use it here, but also we ran into a bunch of performance problems uh, with uh, with ephemeral uh, ingresses that that get mounted on on the front door. So we decided to like look for an for an alternative, and this is when um, we decided to use Envoy. It was actually designed for running in a, in 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 a container first world, and um, Envoy uses Boring SSL as its uh, TLS provider. The nice thing with Boring SSL is like NIST validated Boring SSL, and you can configure it in, in Envoy at build time, just using a, a command line flag to, to turn it on. And currently we run uh, Envoy both as like a forward and a, and a reverse proxy as well. Another big thing in, in the FedRAMP checklist is um, um, host intrusion detection systems. Uh, we run OS Query on all of our machines, and OS Query is basically an endpoint visibility tool. It exposes uh, various information about the host in, um, in a SQL-like uh, database. So for example, you can run a SQL query and just ask which kernel modules uh, is my system, uh, ha my system loaded, and, and so on. The downside with this is that it doesn't have any case integration. So when you have like multiple pods on the same node, those pods basically run the same container image, the container image has the same entry point, so the binary is the same that actually gets, uh, gets spawned. OS query just sees a bunch of processes that basically look the same, same process name, same arguments, just like a different uh, user ID. To, to solve for this, we decided to, to deploy uh, isovalent Tetragon, which is a tool that uses eBPF to collect uh, host process information 
and it also integrates uh, very well with uh, with Gates and Cilium and gets all the information from from other sources and this actually allows us to answer questions like a process is uh, is accessing a malicious uh, endpoint to exfil some data which service account actually deployed that pod what labels it has what container image it's running what network traffic is doing and uh, and so on so this basically gave our infosec team some of like superpowers to reason about like what's uh, what's happening in in the environment uh, next ad is going to talk about some other ongoing challenges that uh, we're still facing yes um so as Vlad mentioned, we'll switch to the other one. Um, CNCF Tech has, has really done a lot for us, uh, as he talked about, and we've been able to kind of meet a lot of these controls in a more effective way. Um, but there are still a lot of other challenges with FedRAMP and IL controls that can't fully be solved um, by that essentially out of the box. Um, so we also wanted to talk a little bit about other things that we've done and, and sort of built on top of Kate's um, that have really helped us meet a number of the other controls as well. Um, so we built a program called FedStart, uh, which is powered by our Apollo product um, that essentially solves the rest of these challenges um, for Palantir and also for any other companies with containerized Kubernetes native applications um, where you want to become FedRAMP or IL accredited uh, for federal government workflows. So we host containerized apps kind of in the product, and they're able to seamlessly meet the majority of the rest of the controls, and we have a few examples of that here. So the first is change management. A lot of the FedRAMP controls, again, as many of you know, if you've kind of dug into it, revolve around how you are managing changes and updates to the system and validating that those are safe prior to rolling them out to production. So for example, changes must be tested in a representative environment before rolling out to a, to a FedRAMP accredited environment. And security relevant changes uh, typically have to be approved by an authorized US person. So figuring out how to kind of fully automate your change management, um, you know, especially with the rise of, of things like GitOps and kind of other uh, automation tools, while still maintaining all these compliance checks is something that can be really challenging. Um, and so Apollo and kind of Kate's has, has helped solve this for us with essentially policy-based rollouts. So we're able to do CICD while still enforcing the right approvals, those US person checks where we need them, um, and also automating essentially that changes roll out to staging or any of our non-regulated production environments before they go to um, our FedRAMP accredited environments. The second one is uh, there are also a lot of process-oriented controls. Um, so, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, or for those of you who are, uh, a lot of FedRAMP controls are actually uh, not technical. Um, they're oriented around policies and procedures and kind of building out processes that impose best security practices on your system. So, for example, your SDLC or your incident monitoring policy and incident response processes and your contingency plan and all your disaster recovery steps. So our standardized infrastructure based on Kate's uh, has made it easier to essentially templatize a lot of these policies and procedures such that a large part is actually consistent across all of the applications that we run in the environment. So for example, we have a standard way of storing backups for all applications that are running in the environment in the underlying cloud storage, which makes it easier to enforce that all applications are able to restore from backups rather than needing to deal with kind of a bespoke backup and restore process for every single application that we run in the environment. And the third one, vulnerability management. We've been talking a lot about this one. Um, Vlad talked about how we use Trivi for scans. Um, but the next immediate question to ask is, OK, how are you going to deal with all the vulnerabilities that, that Trivi has now surfaced? Um, Vlad mentioned this a little bit, uh, but we essentially manage this by utilizing our own minimized images um, to limit our CVE exposure uh, for our tech and, and for a lot of the open source tech that we rely on. And so all the applications that we host in the cluster are able to make use of those as well. So basically by doing that, we're able to really minimize the amount of CVEs that we have to deal with, um, which otherwise can be a really unruly problem. So. Overall, kind of all these things that we've talked about has taken the accreditation process for any new application that we run in the environment to something that you know previously could take years um, to something that's essentially weeks to months instead whenever we want to make updates or kind of add new applications into the environment. So it's been a really great accelerant for us as we talked about, um, and hopefully this was helpful for you all too. 
So that is all the content that we have. Um, and so thank you for listening to our talk. Um, and super excited to open it up to any questions that you all have. Thanks. Yeah, do you want to use the mic that's right there? OK. OK, I'll repeat then. That's fine. Yeah, the question was, uh, what was the role of vendor support and vendor liaisons in helping us manage uh, and kind of get through this process, given you typically have a lot of questions for them about FIPS encryption and, and other things? Do you want to take that one? Yeah, I think what we did in our FedGen package, we actually inherit a bunch of controls from the underlying cloud provider. So, for example, uh, encryption at rest, we do it by like KMS and EBS. S3 and KMS and so on. So I feel like it's basically going for like each control and seeing like at what level do you do you solve for it and can you inherit from like the, the provider you're like running uh, on top. We don't really deploy custom vendor software that handles the data, I think, in our environments. Yeah, I think that's right. So for example, I don't know, take, take, take an example, like we don't use like a vendor elastic search or, or something like this to like handle our data and then we need to like go talk to them, it's like what do you do for like all the things you, you just mentioned, like FIPS encryption and so on, like we have that like in-house for, and it's done by our platform. Yeah, and I think a lot of time for uh, hyperscalers, they now uh, have a lot of public listings too of like which products are FedRAMP accredited, which are moderate, which are high. So you can kind of look there and at least get a brief view before you have to go talk to a person too, which is helpful. Like for example, Amazon has a list of like all the services, like even like the, the, the FIPS encrypted endpoints that you need to use. So for example, like talking to, to KMS, you need to use like a special endpoint, like S3 the same and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Two pretty basic questions. The first one is, uh, you know, we make dual use software and we kind of sell self-hosted Helm chart, you know, type thing. So, in cases where uh, you're not the one operating the platform, but maybe you're selling to the government or the program is operating the platform. Uh, who gets the fed ramp come on like like does everything have to go through or is the process different or is it just hey you don't have to worry about it it's the person it's the program that needs to then get come yeah on. that's a that's a really good question so um yeah all the fed ramp and impact level stuff is pretty much only applicable if you're doing the like traditional cloud hosted SaaS, right where you are the ones who are managing and, and operating the platform and that is because a lot of the controls right are around you do how you do um your encryption management, but also how you're storing secrets, right, and and tokens and like all of those types of things, which you can't actually do if you don't, you know, have control over the underlying infrastructure. Um, so we do have a lot of deployments where it, it's not a SaaS, right? We've had to deploy into a government managed cloud or, or on-prem or to an edge device or something like that in a lot of cases. And uh, typically in those cases, you just go through an individual, what's called an RMF ATO, which you may or may not be familiar with, but so once you get these central accreditations, each government agency still has to grant you an ATO or like an authority to operate for that product being used at that agency. So if it's an installation, again, into a government cloud or, or something that's not a traditional SaaS, you typically just go through a separate ATO uh, for your software at that agency in that environment. Um, which is more work typically for the, the vendors because um, you can't take advantage of the inheritance of you know a cloud accreditation that you already have. Um, so it's possible to do that, but not usually FedRAMP. Um, and more of the controls are shared between you and the government, typically, when that happens, too. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, that's a big help. Uh, okay. The second question is, do you know if there is any effort, or maybe there's already a way, to get a vanilla stigged Kubernetes set up for, like, just kind of smoke testing, you know, your work? Because it seems, you know, it's kind of intimidating, obviously. Yeah. You know? uh, I did not 
find anything that you can pick off the shelf. The closest answer I can give you is OpenShift, OpenShift Container Platform. They have a compliance operator that's able to apply and, re and automatically remediate based on the disastig that they have published, but you still need to do a bunch of manual checks in it. It doesn't have support to like fill up all the gaps. But I think like that's like the closest one that I've seen. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi, great talk. Um, I had a question about your 72 hour rotation policy for your hosts. How do you kind of reconcile that with databases or things that have huge amounts of data? How do you like deal with the fact that you're rotating these every three days and transferring like terabytes of data between them? Uh, <laughs> I'm not part of the database team, but all the products that run into our environment need to comply with this policy. Uh, I can get more info for you if you go down to our booth, or you can actually ask Greg over there in the <laughs> back afterwards, and okay. we can answer this. Okay, got it, thank you. Yeah, at a high level, maybe the only two things I'd add is, um, we also do make use of some of the managed database services, so AWS RDS, right, where it's not, um, they're managing the compliance, yeah, no and so we don't have to deal with the figuring out the role there. Um, but for the databases we do run in containers, um, figuring out kind of all that HA, yeah, I'll defer to Greg, so. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Is is there anything you'll be doing differently with the upcoming Rev Five from what you've presented today in terms of like things you're looking at? Love that question. Um, yes, we we recently basically switched all of our documentation over to using Rev Five, so everything is following that. Um, I would say for the most part, it's actually been pretty consistent. Most of the controls are it, it got renumbered or something, but and maybe the language got tweaked slightly, but most of it is. The same, so nothing has really changed about the way that we run our infrastructure. The primary kind of new control family that was introduced, which maybe you know, but the, all of the um, supply chain like risk and, and mitigation. Um, so that's been a big one where internally at our company, you know, we've been rolling out new processes to um, assess basically what are all the libraries we're taking advantage of, how can we actually trace those, how are we generating S bombs, like how how are we kind of better managing our supply chain security. Um, but that again is kind of baked into like our overall SDLC basically and how we kind of roll out the infrastructure and the application so that we can kind of standardize it everywhere and maintain sort of the same setup that we have today. Um, so that's really the only major thing. Uh, not sure if you had anything particular top of mind, but for the most part, we haven't needed to tweak too much with Rev5. I mean, our main concern I think is around the package signing requirements for things like in terms of libraries that we're using or you know third party stuff and everything else seems pretty straightforward, but we haven't cracked that one yet. Yeah, we can talk more about that if there's specific things yeah. and loop in other folks if they're, okay. if that would be helpful too. Yeah, after. Yeah. Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, I want to make sure I understand I'm pretty new to these things about Cilium, what you said about Cilium. So let's say you have a Kubernetes cluster, you have a couple applications, Java, Ruby, .NET, whatever. Uh, is my understanding correct that you just disable uh, encryption in those applications so, they, so that you don't have to worry about FIPS compliance and you make sure that the Cilium service mesh does the encryption, is that the case? Yeah, so the thing that we actually do is like, we don't change the, the cipher suites in the applications themselves. We turn on uh, encryption via Cilium and the, the, the interesting part is like, we do not allow uh, any application to be deployed as host network. So everything is like part of the pod network. So that's how we ensure that like all the traffic that goes from service to service, like pod to pod, or like pod to uh, any destination like needs to, needs to go, like goes through Cilium itself. All right, great, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned uh, like policy rollouts. Uh, can you like shed some more details on that? And uh, around like the deployment and the CI process, did you guys have to do any changes there? What was it? Sorry, what was the second part? Uh, like CI and the deployment point of view, like were there any changes that you guys had to do? Yeah, so uh, policy-based rollouts, yeah. So there, there's basically a couple of things here. I, I touched on a few, but... Um, we basically have kind of like uh, waves or we call them release channels for how things are actually rolled out across our entire fleet. And so because the government environments have these more stringent requirements of needing to test things in representative environments first, um, that's one of the things we do is basically just like phase all of the rollouts. But then the other sort of policy things that are applied are things like 
again, has this change been approved by the appropriate U.S. person with the appropriate role, et cetera, in order to be rolled out, depending on what it is? Um, has this change existed in a representative environment and not caused any downtime, right? Like, is it actually like a stable release um, before it gets pushed out to these environments? Basically enables us to define logic with how the changes are rolled out in a way that's automated. So it continues to be compliant, but doesn't need as many engineers to kind of babysit throughout the whole thing. Um, but in terms of your question of how we change CICD, I, I do think going for FedRAMP and impact level, you do have to change some of your processes because you have these additional requirements. So you can't kind of do the same thing where developer pushes a change and it rolls out to the environment. You do have to meet kind of additional controls. And that's where we sort of build the automation that enables us to automate it, but also meets those controls, I would say. So one more question, like you guys mentioned about like Helm charts, uh, sorry, the images and uh, for the host, is there anything you guys had to do for Helm charts or any of the manifests, Kubernetes manifests? Uh, for the manifests themselves, no, but all the images that we use, we, we basically republish internally based on our golden image. We have like more questions, but we're out of time. We can like take them in the back over there. follow on to that. Are you sourcing the base images from a third party or are you managing them in-house? Uh, we, we are extracting the binaries from the images themselves and then repackaging those cool. internally. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.